uh, in the book of Ezra, and it was covering uh, God's uh, bringing the children of Israel out of bondage for 70 years. And we know that they were in that bondage because of disobedience to the word of God. And as we studied the history of the children of Israel, we found that they had a pattern of their lifestyle. They went through phases where God brought them out of bondage. And they enjoyed great success, times of peace, and a bounty, and abundance. God created a great name for them among the people. But they would always go through this phase when they were at peace, and things were going well, they always started to turn to themselves and focus on their desires, and start to fulfill their human nature and the things that it wanted that eventually would turn them away from God, leaving them to be disobedient to God. Our nation represents that today as we look across the landscape. Our country was basically quote-unquote founded on the Word of God. And when it was in its growth, uh, it was true to those standards and those principles. Moral ethics is what our nation basically uh, operated in. Our laws and everything that we did were uh, based on those moral ethics and morality and truthfulness and justice. Uh, not that it was perfect, but that overall it was the dominating mindset in our society. And we've watched over the years as that has deteriorated, as more and more people uh, grew into more and more luxury, we found that the families and the backgrounds that didn't suffer as much uh, had less and less moral ethics, had less respect for justice and the law and looking out for others. So much so that our generation now is called the me generation, where it's all about me. There's no respect for law, there's no respect for order, there's no respect for right. Uh, we are now calling wrong right and right wrong. And that's the moral standard for today. Whatever your heart desires do, and that's what Romans chapter one talks about, and even though they need God, they did not glorify him as God. And God said you're going to be without excuse because everything that he has created, the way he created you, lets you know the difference between right and wrong. Let you know that there is a God and no one ever tells you about God. God said you will be out of excuse. He said, even though they knew all of this, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. But they came foolish in their imaginations of what they thought, who they thought God was. And they started to worship the created things rather than the creator. And that's why we are here, because God has called us to be representatives of the creator and to worship the creator and not the things that he's created. And as we went through the book of uh, Ezra, as we've been studying as a church since we're our inception, we found that uh, man has a problem with self selfishness. His focus is about what he wants and what he desires, and he has no desire of taking responsibility for his own behavior. That's why God sent us a champion called Jesus Christ. Yes. To defeat all of those vices that we were all born with, because we were all born as messed up as we would ever be. There's nothing you've done since you've been born on this earth that made you any worse off with God than you were the day you were born. And thank God for that because it lets us know we don't have to take responsibility for the condition in which we find ourselves. Thanks to our champion. Just like we were born messed up through faith in Jesus Christ, you can be declared righteous without doing a thing. Isn't that awesome? I have a fair and just God. Therefore, you don't have to take responsibility, as I said, for the condition in which you were born. But you are going to have to take responsibility for the condition in which you are. And thanks to the victory that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross, we can be declared righteous in the eyes of God without ever doing anything. And there's nothing you can do or not do that will change that. You cannot lose your salvation. Isn't God awesome? Yes. I like a God like that. He's not an Indian giver. 
but the promises of God are true and sure. And that's why this is so awesome, because when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become God's minister. Because we are, as born-again believers, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Not because of anything you did now, don't get lost. But because you were declared holy and righteous, and you have a right standing with God. And you are now God's very own possession. You belong to God. That's because of the victory of Jesus. And as a result, you can now show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his light. To be representatives of that light. And that's who you are. In God's perspective. Those that have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are his chosen ones. His royal priesthood, his ministry, is the responsibility of ministering unto others. That is why you must be careful to live properly among the unbelieving people around you. Because even if they start to accuse you of things that you are doing wrong, when they see your honorable behavior and conduct, it says they will give honor to God when he judges the world. See, it's God's will that your honorable lifestyle should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the King. That's who we are. That's what we've been called to do. That's what we represent. So you to work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval which is your spiritual worship. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth as God's ministers. That's your responsibility. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Must be kind to everybody. Must be able to teach and be patient with difficult people and difficult times. As the brother said, there are times because we see so much going on around us, so much that needs to be done, we can get impatient and want to be doing more than what God is actually doing. That's where the frustration sets in. When you look at your family, when you look at all your, your lifestyle, you may want to be somewhere that you're not. That's your human nature trying to tell you, you, you need to be somewhere that God doesn't have you yet. And it'll start making you trying to make things happen which is where the human nature kicks in. Because he's just not comfortable with the spiritual process where praying can take care of things without putting your hands on it. Patiently waiting on God is guaranteed that it's going to happen without you having to stir it up to get a look. Amen. Sometimes we used to plant a little garden for ourselves. When we were in school, we had those little projects where you plant the plants. There were times you start to see the ground to budge up and I remember some of those times I would kind of scrape the dirt back because I wanted to see it coming up. You know, I just had to see it. But I learned that when you did that, you made the plant weak. Yeah. Yeah. And even though when it grew, it wouldn't be its best because it didn't gather the strength that it needed yeah. by coming up through the ground. But it looked so, such a hard thing. Why should it have to work so hard? Yeah. But that's how it gets its strength. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. And in my impatience and wanting to see the plant before it's time, yeah. I gave it help. Yeah. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Yes. 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 Don't give God help. Yeah, that's it. Stay under the burden. Amen. Amen. It'll strengthen you. It, yeah. it comes to pass. It's Amen. not going to stay there. Yes. Because if you are very observant, Grass grows through concrete. Yes. <laughs> I can't punch through concrete. Yes. <laughs> but that's to show you the awesome power of God that you can't prevent what God has ordained. Amen. You just have to patiently wait on it. Amen. And that's the greatest challenge in serving God. Waiting on it. <clears throat> Some of you may be anxious for your little angels to change back into angels. <laughs> but I'm here to guarantee you when you get frustrated just look in the mirror 
He said, mm, they just like me. I'm married. They'll be all right. And you can be guaranteed that they'll be on a higher level than you. Because that's the preparation. But the enemy wants you looking at what's visible. He wants that because whoever gets the attention gets the victory. Whoever gets the attention gets the victory. That's why we don't seek to uh, identify with people's shortcomings. Because you're only identifying and talking to the human nature. You already know it doesn't have to matter why you do what you do. You know it's because of sin. And their human nature is going to fight against the things of God. And our objective as ministers is to expose that and let you see it yourself. By showing you how foolish you sound when you talk from the human nature. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You might be able to relate to what I'm saying. You may have had some things go into your mind that sounded great when you were thinking about it. Then when you start trying to speak it to others or just speak it out loud... You would stop before you finish the conversation because you realize that don't make no sense. See, your human nature has a way of making things look good with its silence. Yes. And when you're all alone. But as ministers of God, we learn these principles so that as we come out to serve the Lord, we are able to be effective. Because what we want to talk about today is effective church leadership. Effective church leadership. We're going to be coming from Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, but addicted and not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, and devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort and sound doctrine and to refute those that contradict. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, so by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Let the church say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Effective church leadership. And this is so important because you have to understand that we have been called with a purpose. The church is not a social club. It's not an entertainment center. It's not a place where you come to get, to feel good. It's a place where you come to learn the mind of God. 
It's a place where you come to learn and understand what God expects of you. And to get instructions on how to carry out his business. And as we come to Titus, we see that Paul, uh, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, he's come into uh, Crete and he's sit, left Titus there because things are out of order. False doctrine is going through the church and we have a lot of false doctrine going on in our community today. And as I said, said earlier, you know, when you see so much going on around you that's not in line and you have a heart desire for people and you want people to be all right, to be able to enjoy life, there's a hard tendency to sometimes to, to just want to do something. And a lot of times we'll find ourselves doing things that look good, but they're not the things that God has required. And we find ourselves not being effective. So what we want to learn from the lesson today is, how do we silence this false teaching? When you leave here today, you want to be able to know how to deal with the stuff that's going on out there so that you don't find yourself moving ahead of God. Getting out of line with God in order to make a difference. God has given us instructions on how to deal with these things. And he's also given us instructions as a church body on how we're supposed to do things uh, to aid in that silencing of the false teachings. And that's what we want to talk about. As you see in verse 1 through 4, Paul introduces himself while at the same time displaying the proper attitude and purpose of a leader. He identifies himself as a bond servant of God, sent for those chosen of God, and his concentration is on their faith and knowledge of the truth pertaining to Godliness. Paul identifies himself as a bond servant. This is important because as believers of God, we must grow in our knowledge of God's word, because this will be the focus of our faith. We must we must be doers of the word, not just hearers. And you can find that concept in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. You must be doers of the word. And there's great benefit that comes with being doers of the word. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Paul identifies himself as a bond servant. And in the same principle, same place, he's showing us the attitude of an effective leader of God. And that's what which brings us to our first principle when we talk about effective church leadership. We, this allows you as you go across the landscape and you look at the different uh, bodies of Christ, you can look at the leadership and get a good idea of what that body is going to be all about. And this first principle is as effective church leadership, must have an attitude of servitude. You must have an attitude of servitude. You must have an attitude of servitude. And you can see from verses 1 through 4 how he goes through that list of the mindset and the characteristics of a leader. Matthew 23, 8 through 12. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humble, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. You know what he says when he's talking about effective leadership? And it's unfortunate that most people that go into the uh, gospel to serve God, especially as leaders, they go out looking for fame and fortune. Mm -hmm. You have to call them certain things. And they get highly offended when you don't call them these things. Amen. But see, that's not the definition or the description of a true servant of God. A true servant of God understands that he's your servant. But unfortunately, in most of these institutions, you have to serve the pastor. He gets the special seats. He gets the best. We're brothers. The scripture says we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Pastor is just my work. That's not who I am. That's what I do. But you and I are brothers. 
and sisters in Christ. Which lets us know we're evil. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you got to be about serving. What does that look like? Waiting on other folks. You make sure they eat first. You make sure they take care of it. Make sure your stuff is in order. Not trying to make you make sure my stuff is in order. Because I'm supposed to lead by example. And I'm supposed to be showing that faith in God that I'm asking you to have. And most of what others are asking people to do, they're not showing that faith themselves. They're showing their ability to work people to make sure they get what they want. God basically described, and this is when the disciples were having an argument about who was going to be greatest in Jesus' kingdom. And we you know that two of the brothers had, their mother had came up and asked the Lord, could one sit on his right hand and could one sit on his left hand? Verse 42, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles, Lord, it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. For whoever wishes to become great among you shall be the servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for me. Unfortunately, in the religious circles, uh, the, the people are being asked to give their life a ransom for the pastor. That person that sits or stands behind the pulpit. That is not God's way. God said we're supposed to teach you the ways of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that moves upon you uh, to do what you need to do, to make sure things go as they should go. But never are we supposed to push ourselves as some kind of dominant ruler that you're supposed to be worshipping. And unfortunately, in most churches, the pastors are being worshipped. I, I, I like to apologize to all out there that hear this. Uh, I like to apologize on their behalf because they are representing us. And we have a responsibility to make sure that we direct you to God and to Jesus and not to ourselves as an effective leadership. We must have an attitude of servitude, not being served and worshipped. In verse 5, we are told that Paul left Titus in Crete to set the church in proper doctrine. He told them to put the things in order that remain. And the basic task of the church is to teach sound doctrine, not entertain you. The church is not here to support someone's opinion or play on your emotions in order to raise money and, and promote entertainment. That's not why we are here. The church is here to support sound doctrine because that's what protects the church. The church is the pillar and the protector of the truth. As ministers of God, you are supposed to be protectors and pillars of the truth, not your opinions. And unfortunately, too much of that is going on in this guise of serving God and being about God's business. We are here to protect the truth, the word of God. And it's the pastors and the elders' responsibility to make sure that they play. And that pastor is in the form of talking about how sheep and animals are pastors. You nurture them, you take them to feed them, you take them to water, you protect them. That's our responsibility. Not to milk you. And God has put a system in place to make sure that we can be taken care of. But you have to be content with where God has you. And like I said in verse 5, he was told to set things in order. Which brings us to our second principle. We're going to talk about effective leadership. It teaches and promotes sound doctrine. Unfortunately, most churches don't even use Bibles today. Uh, they will use a verse and go on a tangent. Try to get your emotions going. Talking about somebody, talking about somebody. How somebody did this and somebody did that. And why you ain't got no business and nobody's business. You get big amens off of that. Because everybody knows they're doing something they don't have no business doing. And 
they're waiting to find someone to give them some relief by agreeing with them, or at least keeping you out of their business. In most places, it's even a, a sin to point out people's sin in line with the Word of God. But that's what we were called to do. Teaches and promotes sound doctrine. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You see what uh, Paul tells Timothy? 2 Timothy, retain the standards of sound words. As effective leaders, you are to retain the standards of sound words, sound doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Sound doctrine, sound teaching. And that's why the enemy doesn't want you studying the Word of God. That's why when you talk about the Word of God to people, they don't want to hear that, they want to hear your opinion. Mm -hmm. That's the most dangerous thing that you would operate on in this world when you seek to be successful. Your opinion. Because that's all that it is, your opinion. And for that to be effective, you have to have total control over everything that you will ever need in life for your success. Unfortunately, that's not so. But I guess that's fortunate because if we had total control over everything, it would really be a mess for most people, wouldn't it? Everybody that didn't agree with you and find themselves gone. <laughs> also, when you look at verse 5, we are told that Timothy was to appoint elders to lead the church. See, elders are spiritually mature men in the church. They are also known as bishops, overseers, elders, pastors. Unfortunately, these titles have been used to elevate people. They all mean the same. They have different functions, but they mean the same. But once again, when you operate on man's opinion, when you operate in pride, man takes the word of God to try to make himself be something that is not. And this is the only book that puts man in such a compromising, demoralizing situation. Uh, you have to work hard to feel good. When you want to look at yourself and where you are and make you okay. But once you realize that you are born a sinner, worthless, without God with hope, that there ain't nothing good about you, uh, that gives you encouragement to move away from that and to follow what God has to uh, offer you about, about yourself and how he's created you. But that takes a delivered person to want to turn away from what he thinks of themselves. They are also responsible for caring for each church congregation. Elders are the leaders of the New Testament church who rule under the Spirit of God. An elder is not necessarily involved in teaching doctrine because there are other capacities that he actually works in. However, they are all responsible for making decisions after prayer, sometimes after fasting. But the whole objective is, under the true church of God, you don't vote. There's no voting in the church of God. It's not a democracy. <laughs> It is spirit-led people that are influenced by the Holy Spirit in their decision-making. That's why you got to be careful of who you put in leadership in the church. It has to be someone that's committed to the Word of God, committed to prayer, and someone that's willing to wait for the Holy Spirit to bring them the answer. Because there's one Holy Spirit, He's not going to contradict Himself. And if you find yourself trying to make a decision for God, Number one, it has to come from the Word of God. If there is a confusion, if there's a vision, you know that somebody's not operating in the Spirit. There's no such thing as you're going to have your opinion and I'm going to have mine if we operate in the Spirit of God. We talk about effective leadership. And that's why we have to be honest with ourselves on why we think and believe what we believe and why we make the decisions that we make. Which brings us to our third principle. You have to understand that Church leadership is pluralistic. It's not one person calling the shots. Deacons were never, ever 
ever, ever called by God to be in church. Deacons are servants. They're to wait on tables. They have no authority in the church. They have no power to say this or that. Unfortunately, deacons run most churches. Pastors are not given the leeway to do what God has called them to do. That's the biggest problem we have. The church is out of order when it comes to leadership. Elders run the church. They are spirit-filled men that spend their time for doctrine and prayer. Totally different. And the pastor is a part of that elder leadership who is, so to speak, the chairman of that group because the pastor has been given a vision of the church. And God surrounds him with people to carry out that vision, not their vision. And unfortunately, you have too many people trying to carry out their desires and goals in the church and not God's. Leadership must be pluralistic. Leadership must be pluralistic. That's why we are working, being patient, waiting on the Lord to develop elders. Men filled with the Spirit of God. Men who make decisions based on the Spirit of God. That's the qualifications. This is why a lot of churches get in trouble. When you're at places like this, even though you don't see that qualification, you're in such a hurry, you try to put people there because you think it has to be there because it's the standard. The standard is when it gets to that place, when everything is prepared, that's when it's put in place. And so many times, we move ahead of God and we create a mess. It must be pluralistic. Acts 14, 21 through 23. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That was a common practice in the new church as they were building the church. They would go back to the cities and make sure they appointed elders to lead the church. This is the blueprint for the church. And we're supposed to be modeling that, modeling that church. They always went back and established and appointed elders in the church. Sometimes through fasting and praying and trusting the Lord to lead them into his way. That's why you have to understand the importance of truly being born again. Because of being truly born again, you get the right heart. You get that heart surgery that you need to have the heart that you need to serve God. And you have to be in love with God. You have to be sold out to God. And a lot of people are sold out to the idea of being in love with God. But they're not sold out to the idea of truly loving God. Which means putting God first. Yes. Do you know what that actually looks like when you write it out? Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of us say we put God first, but do you really? Because yeah. Yeah. a lot of places that you had to put him first, you didn't because of the fear of what that would look like if you did what you had to do to put him first. That's what you have to start asking yourself. You have to be honest. Do I really put him first or do I put him in where I feel it's safe to put him? or where it's convenient. See, you're not leadership material. Leadership material turns its back on everything because it realizes that whatever I give up for, for God, he's going to give me back a hundredfold in this life. But who's willing to lose what they have when what you have is so much greater than anything you ever experienced? So much so, if it didn't get much better, you'd still be comfortable living out the rest of your life where you are. But who could take such a gamble to just drop everything for God with the faith to know that if I do this because of my love for God, he's going to do what he said he's going to do. But this is the catch. He might not do it as fast as you think. Because sometimes we can emotionally make these decisions, but when it starts to become a long, drawn-out process, we start to have second doubts. 
Well, maybe that wasn't from God. Maybe I, maybe I was premature. Because it's not looking like it should look in my mind if God was really blessing me. That's part of the test. That's why you have to have a heart for God so that you can hear God as he talks to you. Because when you make a decision, you have to be sure that it was from God because when things start to get tough, you don't have to go back and second guess the decision that you made. You know why you made it. And you know what God was teaching you and doing through you when he made, told, led you to make that decision because that's part of your growth also. But unfortunately, because a lot of pastors try to be professional problem solvers. They run around with their little spiritual tool bag trying to see what kind of problems can we fix today. We don't allow a lot of people to go to where God wants them to go. We have a lot of people that are immature and haven't really discovered who they are because all the places that God made before them so they can get to know themselves, we help them out of that. Or let them know it was okay or not to go through that. That's not our job. Man. Our job is to recognize where God is at work. Yeah. Our job is to listen to God and see what he wants us to do in mm -hmm. helping him with that. But using the word of God as our guide. That's why you have to understand the difference between spiritual things and carnal things. Mm -hmm. We don't get caught up in the carnal mindset of human nature. There's no good that comes from it. We're focused on the spirit aspect of who you are. So that means wherever you are, we focus more on how you responded to it rather than how you got there. The question is how are you responding? Because that's telling the truth about who you are. And a lot of times the human nature will have you lying to yourself, making you believe things that are not true. Because it doesn't want you to, to be being a representative for God. And it's convinced so many people in our surroundings to do the same thing. And we have a society now that people talk about God, but no one wants to talk about obeying God. Mm -hmm. That's when the fight comes in. Everybody on Facebook said they love God. But before they finish that, they cursing somebody out. They doing this. They got naked pictures on there. They, they talking all sorts of language. Don't line up with nothing with the word of God. But yet they love God. They having tragedies happening in their lives. But they never consider, well, maybe God's word might be true. I got all this stuff going on in my life that don't line with God. Maybe that's why I'm struggling. Maybe that's why I can't have peace with anybody because I don't have peace with God. Yeah. Maybe that's why nobody wants to agree with me or work with me or try to help me because I won't work with God yeah. in doing what he put me here to do. Basically, I'm here being ineffective. Yes. Now, we talk about what God says he will do if you obey him, right? Well, let's take a minute to get off the track. Let's go to 20, Deuteronomy 29, 8. Because I don't think we've ever done this. We always talk about the good stuff. Which is what most people like to do. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 15. Start at verse 15. The consequences of disobedience to God. Because we are trying to establish effective leadership. Now when you go through these verses, I want you to think about the stuff that you see going on around you. Then I want you to really think about the people that it's going on with. Then I want you to do some evaluating. Are you with me? But it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be shall be your basket and your needle loaf. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, and rebuke in all you undertake to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly. 
on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from the land where you are entering to possess it. The Lord will smite you with consumption and with fever and with inflammation and with fiery heat and with the sword and with blight and with mildew and they will pursue you until you perish. Anybody feel like somebody just chasing you down? The heaven which is over you, your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land power and dust from heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them, but you will flee seven ways before them, and you will be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses will be food to all birds of the sky and to the beasts of the earth, and there will be no more, no one to frighten them away. The Lord will smite you with the balls of Egypt and with tumors and with the scab and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. And you will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness, and you will not prosper in your ways. But you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually with no one to save you. You shall be taught a wife, but another man will violate her. You shall build a house, but you will not live in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you will not use its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will not eat of it. Your donkey shall be torn away from you and will not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, and you will have no one to save you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, while your eyes look on and yearn for them continually. But there will be nothing you can do. A people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors. And you will never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually. You shall be driven mad by the sight of what you see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and legs with sore boils from which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall become a horror, a proverb, and a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locusts will consume you. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourselves with the oil, for your oils, your, your olives will drop off. You shall have sons and daughters, but they will not be yours, for they will go into captivity. The cricket shall possess all your trees and the produce of your ground. The alien who is among you shall rise above you higher and higher, but you will go down lower and lower. He shall lend, he shall lend to you, but you will not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you will be the tail. So all these curses shall come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the word of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments, his statutes which he commanded you. They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever. That's our responsibility as leaders, to let you know the truth about sin and the blessings of obedience. Now, as we've read through all of that, as you look throughout your community, do you see any of that going on? Among the people that call upon the name of the Lord? They're constantly praying and fasting, but they're constantly getting this result? Why? Because they disobey the word of the Lord. Have you constantly not noticed that as you have conditions here, you see them decreasing rather than increasing? Have you noticed those that were in your midst and left had situations that were coming under control? As soon as they left, they went out of control? Yeah. See, those are facts. Yes. Yeah. That's not imaginary or made up. Yeah. These are truths that we're speaking. Yes. Where you have been written off, had conditions that people normally get written off, and you find yourself recovering. These are proofs 
that you can prove among yourselves based on the word of God. Well, who wants to hear such a thing? That obedience to God works. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel for people, but you have to ask yourself, what kind of lifestyle? Yeah. And when you hear about all the catastrophes that's happening to people around you, the enemy sometimes will try to make you compare yourself, well, wait a minute. Yeah. They don't live the same lifestyle uh -huh. I live. Amen. I'm not comparing myself them. with them or anything else because I know where I stand in my word and with God, and I know what he has promised, and I have evidence yeah. and proof, not just with others, but with myself, yeah. that it's working. That's the benefit. That's what he promised. Yeah. That's the encouragement. Mm -hmm. That no matter how bad your stuff look, you know that the consequences can't come because of your obedience to the word of God. Yes. He didn't say it wouldn't look like it was going bad. He didn't say it wouldn't sound like it's going bad. He didn't say it wouldn't be bad through a stretch. Because he said he allows those stretches to happen. Yeah. To see when you obey him All right. right there. Yes. Yes. Because that's usually where most people get off because it seems too terrible. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Aren't you glad you learned how to move through instead of move out? Yes. <laughs> Haven't you learned and aren't you glad that you have learned how to just stop and be still yeah. when you get overburdened or feel like you're overburdened? Yeah. Because you realize that right here, I have some things in control that shouldn't be in control. Oh, so I ain't going to try to move on right now. I got to put some things in order. There you go. Are you here? Yes. yes. And yes. once I bring those thoughts into captivity, it. then it'll be yeah. time to move on. Yeah. Yes. That's it. But the enemy wants you trying to move yeah. on with a messed up mind. Yeah. Yes. That's it. And when you move up with a messed up mind, you do things you shouldn't do. Yeah. And when you find yourself doing things that you shouldn't do, you find yourself in a terrible way. Yeah, amen. That's it. That's the train. Because somewhere in that equation, he's supposed to be able to shake you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you come to your senses. Amen. The prodigal son came to himself. All right, man. And he realized that he was better off at home. At home. Yeah. That his slaves were better off at his house than he was out on his own. Yeah. But well, sometimes it takes people longer yeah. to realize that they came naked yeah. on their own. They just keep on fighting and trying. Yeah. But eventually, you're going to run out of aces. Because it's only four in a day. <laughs> you realize that, you know what? I played my best hand, and I don't know what to do. Anybody got to that place yet? I just don't know what to do. I just I just did all I could do. It don't look like nothing getting no better. Amen. God, it's about time. Yeah. You didn't even have to come this far. Amen. I told you you were born messed up. Amen. I told you that you didn't have a clue on how to get to me. Mm -hmm. But you wanted to try it anyway, didn't you? And I gave, I gave you A for effort. Because if I ever get you transformed, I can use that same attitude. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing sometimes once we get transformed. We forget all that. We ain't determined to do nothing no more. We turn it over fleece after fleece for God to prove to us that he's with us. Amen. We got so much proof right before us. See, sometimes we forget where we are. But you take about 30 seconds and remember where you were eight years ago. Remember where you were eight years ago. 2007. Now look at where you're at now. Is it better or worse? Better. better. Why you got your face to it? Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. guess what? Wherever you are right now, it's going to be your good old days 20 years from now. Yeah. <laughs> you realize that, right? Come on, man. <laughs> 20 years from now, you can say, man, you remember back in 2015? That was the good old days, man. Man, things was good. Things were good. So let's do this. If you know that's going to happen anyway. <laughs> you know that's going to happen anyway. Come on, man. Let's just say, you know what? It's going to be good old days later. Let's make them the good old times right now. Let's pull out the fatty cab. Let's have a party. Let's have a good time. Because these are really the good old days. And so when you get to the good old days, it'll really be true. Yeah. 
You won't be like the children of Israel coming out of Egypt in the desert talking about how good they had it made. Eating the grapes and the pomegranates. You see that picture? I see somebody laid back, getting fanned, with a hammock or something, picking off grapes. Life is good. Them juggles are getting whipped, beat down daily. You can see their ribs. Yeah. Yeah. Dying daily. Yeah. Making bricks without straw. Now, that's magic yeah. in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the good old days once yeah. they got to the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> see, that's the foolishness of the human mind. That's it. You can make anything look good when you yeah. move into what God. That person used to beat you down every night. They've been gone six months. You think about how great a time y'all had. Yeah. Hey. How much they love y'all were. Yes. Black eyes are healed up now. You don't see no evidence, but you know, you just can't, your mind can't, you won't remember. But they want you back in that destruction. Yeah. And that's what the enemy is trying to do for us. That's why we have to know both sides of the story in our service to God. Which brings us to our Verse 6 through 8, we are given the qualification of the elders uh, while being told that they are to be above reproach. This brings us to this next principle is effective leadership. This brings us to this next principle is effective leadership must be spiritually mature. And the whole thing that God is doing there is trying to bring you to spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. Unfortunately, in most sections of the religious community, you don't have to be sure, but sure, you just have to be breathing. You don't really have to be willing. Just breathe. That's it. Yeah. They will do something to make you do something. Yeah. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Must be spiritually mature. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate. Prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnation, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own house well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new, not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And not a new convert. Let me repeat that. Not a new convert. It's amazing that you can go into church today and be preaching and a pastor next week. You ain't qualified to be a member yet. But he says, not a new kind of How many baby preachers we got going on now? <coughs> but you see how much of the word of God you have to disobey yeah. to go along with most of the stuff that you see going on out yeah. there? Yeah. I'd rather take my chances on the word of God, not man's opinion. Because that's the world's problem. Man's when you are serving God correctly, you will have a good report of God and man, people in the church and people outside of the church. Because if you are following God, you're supposed to be operating in the law of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. But unfortunately, most hatred that you find in our community is coming out of the church. Yeah. The prejudice. Yeah. All of the things that are going on, all in the name of serving God. You hate people because of their conditions. We are all spirit created in the image and likeness of God. That's the one thing every human being has in common. You are not your condition. You are not your circumstances. You are not your job. You are not your uh, school. You are not your team. You are spirit created in the image and likeness of God. And man and the world wants you to identify yourself by your conditions, your circumstances, your race, your gender. That's what causes division. That's what prevents people from growing and being delivered from the things that bind them. It's not about your culture. It's not about your race. It's about you are spirit that makes us all alike. 
That's what we must have to understand. That's what a spiritually mature person understands. And you stop calling people by their condition. You stop calling your children by their condition. Yeah, that's it. You stop dealing with them because of their condition. You start dealing with them of who they are. Yeah. Their spirit. You start nurturing him. Amen. You start identifying him. You start giving him all the attention and let the other one go like it like he was doing the spirit man. Amen. We know how to do it. Yeah. Let's start focusing on developing the spirit person. What do you have in place for them to grow on, to eat on, Man. to develop with? What do you have in place for them to develop? Yeah. And so many times our environment is, is, is filled with things that develop the carnal man, yeah. and we expect the spirit man to grow. Yeah. God, I don't care how much you talk about it, but if you don't have anything in place to make it so, it's not going to happen. Go ahead. Are you hearing me? Yes. There comes a time when you're able to handle anything. Amen. That's it. But yeah. before that time comes, you have to be a strict trainer. Yeah. Man. Development and growth. Wow. Hey, man. Yeah. And that's what everything we do in our yeah. society. That's it. That's it. You go on a job, they don't put you out there. You, you, you working with somebody until you get it. Yeah. That's it. And then the first nine of days, you get fired just for being there sometimes. Yeah. That's it. But they expect you to train. And even after the nine of days, they know you're not complete. And they have you under strict supervision if they have any kind of quality demands of their jobs. But the church is not like you. You just come in and be whatever you want to be. Yeah. And it's full of attitudes and stuff that don't have nothing to do with God. That's why most people hate church. Yeah. One of the worst places to go. It's supposed to be a family with everybody killing each other and talking about each other and trying to hurt each other. That's not a mature church. That's an immature church or a church planted by Satan. Yeah. That's not who we are. It's because of the immaturity that's going in the church and its leadership that doesn't know how to lead people in righteousness. No one is skilled in the word of righteousness in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Concerning him, we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the organs of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who practices or partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So you have to be practicing righteousness to grow spiritually. It has nothing to do with how long you've been in the church. It has to do with your spiritual training, which is why we focus on practicing righteousness practicing being in obedience to the word of God because that's how we grow spiritually. It's not about the show. It's not about the entertainment. It's not whether you're on this group or this group. Are you being taught righteousness? Are you being taught how to obey the word of God when somebody cuts you off in traffic? When somebody talks trash about you on your job? It's amazing we see our society. Everybody is concerned about what people are saying about them. Or what they think about them. Yeah. That is, wow, that is lost. Yeah. When you give people that kind of control over your behavior. Yeah, that's it. And have you acting all out of character. Yeah. The it. best thing you do for stuff like that is to ignore it. That's your greatest power over it. Yeah. Not to let it impact you. <laughs> Amen. Yes. If I know I can pull your chain, when I feel like pulling the chain, guess what I'm going to do? Pull it. Pull it. Yeah. Watch it. You, you tell us some people sometimes. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Let me show you how I make tea. Let me show you how I make tea get on. Yeah. Now I go on that mess with tea. Yeah. And you be like, <laughs> I told you, that's my boy. That's my man. Yeah. I got him. Yeah. I own him. Yeah. And you all allowing people to own you mm -hmm. that don't even know you. Yeah. God did not create man to rule over anybody. Yes. He created man to serve one another and to rule over his creation. But you have to be empowered by God to do so. You must start practicing righteousness if you want to grow your children. In verses 9 through 14, we're told that the elders are to operate a sound doctrine and must be able to refute and exhort those who contradict the word of God. Not fuss and fight, but you have to be able to teach. That's why we are focusing on learning how to identify and associate with this spirit man. So that we don't get caught up in conversation with the human nature, whether it be yours 
or someone else's. We ignore it. That sounds rude to the person that's talking to you. But what you do is you allow them to see how foolish they're talking by simply asking questions. Why do you think that way? And you will be amazed at the things that people say they believe in faith. And they can't even tell you why if you don't let them distract you in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe that? Um, 